we are good to go. All right, let's just go ahead and get started. So hi everyone, we are thrilled to roll out the latest episode of the Quantum Seminar Series, which is dedicated to the research and academic quantum communities. This Kiss Kit Seminar takes place every Friday at noon Eastern Time right here, and is hosted on the Kiss Kit YouTube channel, so if you're not subscribed already, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss any exciting talks. I'm your host for today. My name is Olivia Lanes from IBM Quantum, and I'm very excited to be here today speaking with Ed Barnes, who will be talking to us about noise-resistant quantum control from geometric space curves. So uh, a little bit about Ed. Ed did his PhD at UC San Diego in string theory, and then did his postdoc at the University of Maryland, where he was in the Condensed Matter Theory Center, and then moved on to JQI. And he joined Virginia Tech as a professor in 2015. And I'm very excited to be hosting a, or to be giving a seminar at Virginia Tech uh, on Monday. So that's a funny little coincidence. So thank you, Ed, for being here today. And how's it going? Hi, Olivia. Thanks a lot for the introduction and thanks a lot to the organizer for the opportunity to speak in this uh, great seminar series. So as Olivia said, I'm going to talk about um, quantum control and connections to geometric space curves. So I'm not going to assume anybody knows anything about geometric space curves, what that word even means. So please feel free to ask questions at any point along, along the way. I'm going to hopefully make it uh, very pedagogical and introductory, but still please ask questions. Yeah, and I'll be monitoring the chat. Sorry to interrupt. So if anyone has any questions throughout, um, please go ahead and write them at any moment, and I'll do my very best to politely interrupt Ed uh, whenever those questions should arise. So I'll let you take it from now. Yeah, please do. So <clears throat> here's just a quick snapshot of the research happening in my group. So quantum control is just a, a small part of it. We do lots of work in quantum simulation algorithms, uh, mostly for near-term devices, but also beyond. Uh, we do a bit of work in quantum communications and networks. And uh, in this talk, we'll focus more on quantum computing and control type questions. So the starting point for this work is to take a look at the kind of what the state of the art is in terms of matter-based quantum computing at the moment. So there are several different, uh, rather different types of physical systems and platforms that have made a lot of progress in the last couple of decades and scaling up to larger numbers of qubits and better control and, and better applications. So some of these include superconducting qubits, like those being pursued at IBM, semiconductor spin qubits, Here's a picture of a recent device from Pettis Group at Princeton, and also trapped ion quantum computing. This is an image from trapped ions from Chris Monroe's group. Uh, he was at Maryland at the time, now he's at Duke. And each of these systems is uh, able to create processors in containing anywhere from 10 to 100 qubits at this point. And some of the main ob obstacles at this point are to figure out how we can overcome things like noise and decoherence, which is a, a main limiting factor in the kinds of applications we can run on these devices, and how we can scale up to larger systems. So, you know, one way to deal with noise and decoherence is to get a better understanding of materials and devices. So can, if we can make cleaner devices, better materials, then we can try to eliminate noise at the source. Uh, and there's been a lot of progress um, on this front across a, all the, a range of different platforms. Um, but some noise is, is always inevitable because at the end of the day, we have to you know, get into the qubit, control it, make it do interesting things. And that always opens up the qubit to, to its environment. It exposes it to noise. And so what more can we do to, to combat this problem? So this talk is about how we can take information about the noise and use that information to design robust control schemes. So we can kind of think about this as combating noise, not only at the hardware level, but also at the software level just adjusting the, the kinds of signals that we send in to rotate qubits and entangle them, uh, we can also counteract some of these noise effects and slow down decoherence. So this is not a new idea. It's been around for um, about 60 or 70 years at this point. Uh, it originated um, back in the field of nuclear magnetic resonance, I think, where people are concerned with trying to control nuclear spins and various kinds of materials uh, or solutions. And to get a kind of a simple understanding of what the noise does in this kind of uh, scenario, we can think about just a single qubit for a second. And we know we can describe this qubit using a block sphere and a spin vector, which points at some point on the block sphere. And now if we have, for example, noise in the form of a fluctuating magnetic field, uh, say in the, the vertical direction here, so we can say delta is the field that we 
want to or, or keep it to experience, but then there's some small fluctuation epsilon that is going to change the precession rate of the qubit. So if we start with the qubit pointing along the, say, the x direction, and we then let it precess, it's going to be pointing along some other direction at a later time. But now if we run this experiment many times, and each time the fluctuation in the field is a little bit different, then each time the precession frequency is going to be different. And if we look at, say, six different runs of the experiment, we end up with six different spin vectors pointing along different directions, just because each time the precession frequency was different. And now what often happens in experiments is that we need to average over all of these different runs of the experiment to get a strong enough signal. And because the spin's pointing in different directions at the same, you know, from these different runs, when we average them together, we end up with this decaying signal. So this is an example from a quantum dot spin qubit uh, from the Mirius Jacobi's group at Harvard. And here they're just showing that you start off with a nice coherent spin, but because of this um, different precession frequencies, incoherently adding together, you get this kind of rapid decay of the signal. And you can think about this as the loss of information from the qubit into its environment. And in this particular case, it's happening on the scale of tens of nanoseconds, which is very fast. So in nuclear magnetic resonance, people realize that this kind of uh, issue happens you know, quite often, and they came up with a simple scheme to try to counteract this, this uh, dephasing effect, as it's called. And what you could do is you can apply a really fast pi pulse um, halfway through the evolution. So if we consider the same scenario again, where we start with a spin along the x direction and different runs of the experiment, will have it processing at different frequencies. But regardless of what the precession frequency is in that particular run, if we apply a pi pulse exactly at this point and flip all of the uh, different runs of the uh, experiment, about the, the x-axis or the y-axis, I guess, in this case, then all the spins will be just pointing 180 degrees you know, in the opposite direction. So now if you wait the same amount of time, you know, the ones that were processing faster are further away from the final state that you're after. But since they're processing faster, they're going to catch up to the slower ones so that in the end, all the spin vectors coalesce together and point along the same direction. So this, this uh, spin echo pulse, as it's called, is just refocusing the spin. It's counteracting the, the effect of having different precession frequencies in different run, runs of the experiment. So this is a classic technique that's been around for 70 years now. It's been used quite heavily in quantum computing um, scenarios. And it's also been generalized to not just one single pi pulse, but multiple pi pulses being applied during the evolution of the qubit. And by having more pi pulses, you can better counteract the effects of noise, especially if the fluctuations are happening more quickly in time. Having more pulses can be, can be better. And this uh, type of dynamical decoupling um, the technique has been applied in a variety of different systems. Here, th these are three different examples of different types of spin qubits. Uh, this one is quantum dot spin qubits in gallium arsenide. Uh, this one is an NV center in diamond in the lower right here. And this one is a phosphorus uh, donor in silicon. And in each case, I'm just plotting the coherence function as a function of time. Uh, when these additional pi pulses are applied, and you can, can see that this coherence time is extended rather dramatically. So in the case of this quantum dot spin qubit, for example, where we had 25 nanoseconds uh, decay time, now it's been increased up to you know, many hundreds of microseconds. But in quantum computing, we're not only interested in preserving the state of the qubit, which is what these dynamical decoupling techniques do, we also want to perform operations on them. So the question becomes, can we perform operations while at the same time combating this noise effect? So here, you know, what do I mean by quantum gate? The quantum gate is just the evolution operator of the qubit. So here, you know, this is the time dependent Schrodinger equation, the standard one for describing how the evolution operator evolved in time given some Hamiltonian. And if we're talking about a single qubit, the Hamiltonian can look something like this, where we have a constant field delta on the z-axis here and a driving field omega t on, say, the x-axis. So the goal for designing a quantum gauge is to arrange, is to choose this driving field omega t in such a way that at the final time, the evolution operator has some desired form in some particular unitary matrix that you're trying to create. So quantum information technologies require the ability to implement quantum gates with extremely high precision in order to do interesting algorithms like Shor's algorithm or simulation. And so can we cancel noise while we're doing this gate operation? So in general, we can imagine that there are multiple types of noise acting on the qubit, and we can describe that noise by introducing um, 
perturbative error terms in the Hamiltonian. So for example, if this constant delta has some small fluctuation epsilon, like in the B field case I talked about earlier, I would describe it this way in the Hamiltonian. And in general, also the driving field itself can have noise fluctuations, which I can describe by delta of omega here. So the question is then, can we somehow choose this driving field omega of t such that the actual evol evolution operator that is created is the target operation that we want, the quantum gate. And we're also somehow able to cancel at least the first order noise terms and maybe even higher order as well, just by choosing the shape of this driving field appropriately. So here I'm imagining I've managed to cancel the first order in both epsilon and in delta of omega. So this is the overall objective here. Can we design driving fields in such a way that we have an automatic self-cancellation of at least the first few orders of these noise terms in our evolution operator so that we get uh, much higher precision in our gate operations? So this um, idea has been around for a few decades and there's been a lot of work um, using various approaches. A common technique that people use, uh, which also dates back to nuclear magnetic resonance is to use sequences of square pulses. So one reason why people like to use square pulses in particular is because they're mathematically easy to deal with. It's really easy to solve the time-dependent Schrodinger equation if, you're square, if your pulse profile is a square. Um, on the other hand, square pulses, you know, even though that they, they can describe finite pulses, they're not like delta functions, which assume infinite pulse strength, which is unphysical. Um, they're still not really ideal for real experiments because there are restrictions on the, the sorts of waveforms you can generate in an actual experiment. And for example, it's impossible to go from zero to some finite value in, in zero time. In reality, there's some finite slope here that has to be present because the waveform generator is not, cannot change pulse waveforms infinitely fast. And so um, myself and several collaborators came up with sequences of square waveforms in the context of spin qubits and quantum dots to see if we can do this dynamical noise cancellation in gate operations. Um, but we found that ultimately the fact that square pulses are not very feasible for experiments makes them rather limited and their performance is not, is not terribly good. So that led us to start thinking about at Virginia Tech if, there's, if there are ways to get around this square pulse assumption. Can we move to smooth pulses? Can we find smooth waveforms that still affect the same sort of noise cancellation that we're after? So, to give you an idea of how this works, let's look at the simplest possible case. So here I have a single qubit. I have a driving field omega of t, which is being applied along the x-axis of the qubit. And then in this case, I'm going to switch off the constant delta that I had earlier. And I'm just going to have this noise term epsilon on the diagonals. So if you like, you can think about this as like the Ravi problem where I'm driving the qubit and I, I'm tuning my qubit frequency. I'm tuning my drive frequency so that it's resonant with the qubit frequency. Um, but there's some fluctuation in the qubit frequency, which is this epsilon, so that my pulse, even though it's designed to be resonant, is actually slightly off resonant because of the noise. So that's what this Hamiltonian describes. Now, in order to get a handle on how I can cancel powers of epsilon in the evolution operator, I can try to expand the evolution operator in a power series in epsilon. And so at zeroth order, I have the target operation I want to generate. And then order by order in epsilon, I have this series of terms. And in each term, I see that there's some function g of t here, which basically carries all of the time dependence in this error. And then there's some constant matrix m at each order. So if I want to cancel noise, I need to arrange somehow for this function g of t to vanish at the final time, which I'll call capital T. So if I can make g1 of t vanish, then that means the first order noise will be removed. If I can also make g2 of t vanish, that means the second order noise will, will be removed and so on. And actually all the pulse sequences that have been developed in the context of NMR, all these dynamical decoupling sequences, uh, exactly satisfy the, this set of constraints. This is one way to derive those pulse sequences. And interestingly, these different coefficients, these functions g of t, have satisfied this simple recursion relation, which depends on the driving field that's applied to the qubit. So what we noticed is that we can take the first order term here, take the first order coefficient, g1 of t. This is a coefficient inside the evolution operator. Um, in general, it's a complex function. 
So I can write it in terms of a real part x of t and an imaginary part y of t. And I can think about this as a curve in the complex plane. And initially at time t equals 0, g1 of 0 is 0 because I don't have any error initially. And you can see from this integral expression here that's going to vanish if t is 0. So I start at the origin. And as time progresses, I trace out some path in this complex plane. So, so far, I haven't said anything really interesting. It's just a plotting a complex function. But what's interesting and surprising, at least it was to us, is that if you compute the curvature at each point along the curve, by which I mean draw a circle that has the same amount of bend as the curve it does at that point, and look at the inverse radius of that circle, that um, curvature omega is exactly equal to the driving field. So this is a surprising result that has a lot of um, important implications as I'm going to talk about for the rest of this talk. We do have a question here, Ed. Um, yeah. I'm not sure I understand it entirely, so I'll just read it and maybe they can elaborate unless you understand what they're talking about exactly. Sure. So cool. the question is, could you elaborate on why the various GNs are related? Oh, so why this recursion relation comes out of the math? I think that's what they mean, but um, it, it, if the person who asked the question wants to just clarify, go ahead. Um, he said, meaning, yes, yes, why is gn related to gn minus 1? Okay. Um, so I don't know how to give a non-mathematical answer to that question. I think if, if you just do a perturbation series expansion of the time-dependent Schrodinger equation uh, using this ansatz here for the evolution operator, you just find that these coefficients satisfy this, this uh, pattern. Yep. Okay, makes sense to me. Uh, we can keep going if you want. Okay. Um, so when I draw this complex curve, I discover that the curvature of the curve is given by the driving field, omega of t. And it also turns out that the arc length along the curve which is you know, kind of the, the length of the curve, if I imagine stretching it out, how far would, I, would it reach away from the origin? That's equal to the time. So the evolution time is equal to arc length. So those simple statements have very powerful implications. Because if you think about what I'm trying to do here, I'm trying to cancel the noise. Here I'm plotting essentially the first order noise term. The further away I am from the origin at any given time is telling me how much noise I've accumulated up to that point. And if I want to make sure noise is canceled in the end, then I need this curve to come back to the origin so that at least at first order, the noise is removed. And then the whole question is, how do I find the pulse that cancels noise? Well, I basically just found the answer because if I draw a closed curve, if I draw a curve that comes back to the origin, I can compute its curvature and that tells me the pulse. It tells me the pulse that cancels the noise. And if I look at the length of the curve I drew, that tells me how long it takes to cancel the noise. It tells me the, the duration of the gate I created. So that idea is illustrated on this slide here. So if I want to cancel first order noise, I draw a closed curve. And so long as it comes back to the origin, I'm guaranteed that the first order noise term is canceled. And I can extract the pulse that does this operation by computing the curvature. There's some simple formula for it. I, didn't, I don't have it on the slide. But in this example, this is what the pulse looks like. It's a nice smooth curve. And you can more or less guess what the pulse is going to look like just by looking at the shape of the curve. You know, Whenever the curve bends more, that's when the pulse is going to be strongest. And whenever the curve is more or less flat or straight, that's when the pulse is going to be smallest. So here you can see near the origin, it's, it's a fairly straight line that I have, but then it starts to bend a lot toward the middle. And that's why the pulse rises up and reaches a peak in the middle. And then it straightens out again at the end, and so the pulse comes back to zero. Now, in addition to that, I can also immediately read off from this curve what the operation is that I'm performing on the qubit. And it's given by the opening angle at the origin. So then if I want to perform different operations on my qubit while canceling the first order noise, 
I just need to draw different closed curves with different opening angles at the origin. And depending on which opening angle I arrange for, that's going to give me the rotation angle that I'm performing on the qubit. So here in this lower panel, panel C here, I'm showing four different closed curves with different opening angles at the origin. Um, they implement four different gate operations using these four different pulses obtained from their curvatures. Uh, and they all cancel noise to first order. Now, this is a general solution to the problem. I've made no assumptions whatsoever. Any pulse that cancels noise corresponds to a closed curve. So this means that if I go back to these famous dynamical decoupling sequences like spin echo and others, I should be able to understand them from the point of view of this, ge this uh, geometric framework. So for example, if I look at spin echo, spin echo we said is a single infinitely fast pulse halfway through the evolution. So this arrow here is meant to represent a delta function. And if I translate that to a curve, well, since the curvature tells me the pulse, initially I have no pulse in this spin echo sequence, which means I have no curvature. So I start at the origin and I follow a straight line, no curvature. But now I have this infinitely strong pulse halfway through, that's infinite curvature, very sudden. And so I turn around infinitely fast at the top point here. And then I start to retrace the line back down to the origin because after this delta function pulse, again, there's no pulse being applied. So the curvature is zero. So this is what the curve looks like for the spin echo sequence. You go up and you come down. Any other delta function sequence with multiple delta functions corresponds to retracing a line over and over again. So here for CPMG, this is a four pulse CPMG sequence. You can see you know, this particular pulse spacing for this sequence. In this case, I'm starting here at the origin, which is in the middle of this panel. Initially, there's no pulse, so I follow a straight line. And then when I come to the first pulse, I turn around and I come back. But now the time to the second pulse is twice as long, so I come all the way down here. And then the second pulse happens, and then I come back up, and I keep going up and down, depending on how many pulses I have. And then the last time span here is half of the spacing between the pulses. And so I stop at the origin at the end. And the fact that I stop at the origin at the end guarantees that the first order noise is canceled. So any delta function sequence can be understood in this way. You're basically just retracing a line multiple times in such a way that you end up back at the origin at the end. So you can understand all the previous dynamical decoupling sequences based on delta functions this way, and you can also derive infinitely many more yeah, using this idea. But you don't have to use delta functions and you don't have to stay on the line. The general solution here is to draw any closed curve on a plane. And when you do this, you can not only preserve the state of the qubit, you can also perform rotations while you're canceling noise. And also importantly, you can create nice smooth pulse waveforms that cancel noise. You don't have to assume delta functions or square shapes, which are experimentally unrealistic. Now, the story gets still more interesting. So if you also want to cancel second order, it turns out that the condition for canceling the second order term and that perturbative expansion of the evolution operator is that the area enclosed by the curve has to vanish. So now instead of drawing a single loop like this that comes back to the origin, I can instead draw a figure eight like this blue line here. And it's nice and symmetric. And in the upper half, I go counterclockwise. In the lower half, I go clockwise, which means that there's a relative sign related to the orientations of these two lobes. And so the net area cancels. So any figure eight I draw is going to give me a pulse, which cancels noise up to second order. So here I have four different figure eights, and these are the four different pulses that come out of the curvatures of those, of those figure eights. So one nice way to get figure eights like this is to go back to the 19th century math literature, where a lot of the famous mathematicians had their favorite lemnus gates. Lemnus gate just means figure eight. So this is Bernoulli's lemnus gate. There's a family of them. Um, but now I should say here, if I want to do a non-trivial gate operation on my qubit while I'm canceling noise, I need to make sure that the opening angle at the origin has different values. So here, when I have a perfect figure eight, I can only do an identity gate, it turns out. If I want to do a non-trivial gate, I need to have less symmetric looking curves, but I can still make the vanishing area condition work. So for example, I can look at this orange curve here this is a deformed figure eight. 
um, which has a non-trivial opening angle at the origin, but is still designed such that the two lobes have equal and opposite areas so that the second order noise is still canceled. So these are again four different deformed figure eight shapes here with different opening angles at the origin. These give me four different pulses that are robust to second order that implement different gate operations. And I can tune that operation just by tuning the opening angle at the origin. Uh, another question for you, Ed. Um, can you explain a little bit more what you mean by a non-trivial angle at the origin and how that would relate to what you do in the lab, like in reality when you're programming? Yeah, so in the laboratory, I would basically just take the end result for the pulse here. So the way it works when I work with my experimental collaborators, for example, is they tell me that they need a, a pulse that is you know, able to implement, say, a pi over two rotation about the x-axis. Mm -hmm. and they want to cancel noise to second order. So then that means I'm going to go and I'm going to draw a deformed figure eight like this in such a way that the opening angle at the origin is pi over two. And then I can read off the curvature using some formula from differential geometry, and that gives me the pulse, which I then give to my collaborator, and hopefully they can test it out in the lab and confirm that it indeed cancels noise to second order. Okay, thanks. Now, so uh, another thing I mentioned on an earlier slide is that the evolution time is equal to the length of the curve. So this also has powerful impl implications because oftentimes, you know, we're interested in canceling noise, but we also want to do gates as quickly as possible because we still have decoherence, we still have relaxation, we still have all kinds of adverse effects acting on the qubits, and we're trying to get computations done as quickly as possible before those, those adverse effects take over everything. And, and ruin my processor. So the fact that the, uh, the length of the curve is the evolution time means that I can systematically look for point pulses that cancel noise while implementing gates as fast as possible. So the shorter the time, the shorter the curve. Now I could draw a closed curve to cancel first order noise, and then I could just shrink it. And you know, I can, if I shrink it, I'm going to decrease the time it takes because the overall length of the curve is reduced. But this also means that I'm enhancing the pulse amplitude because if I shrink a curve, I'm increasing the curvature at the same time. I'm, I have tighter and tighter bends in my curve. So the pulse amplitude uh, increases as I shrink the curve. So in reality, in most experiments, or maybe all experiments, there's some upper bound on the pulse amplitude that can be achieved. And so really I should put a constraint on the pulse amplitude. And in this geometric way of thinking about things, that means that there should be a constraint on the curvature of the curve I draw. So then I can write down a constrained geometric optimization problem. How do I find the shortest curve that does not have a curvature that exceeds some amount that is closed? So this is a variational calculus problem. You can write down a Lagrangian for this. The Lagrangian, the main term in the Lagrangian is the length of the curve, which is this first term here. And then I can introduce Lagrange multiplier terms that impose this constraint that the curvature not exceed the maximum amount. So I won't get into the math here, but this turns out to be a trivial problem to solve. You can write down the Lagrange, uh, Euler-Lagrange equations, and you can solve them very easily. And the answer is that the optimal curve is made up of straight lines and circular arcs. Now, there are a few different ways you can find the shortest curves made of straight lines and circular arcs. I could think of three of them that involve only three different segments, and they're shown here. I could have two straight lines and then a circular arc here to close it off. Or I could have one straight line followed by two circular arcs and that gives me a closed loop. Or I could use three circular arcs joined together to get another closed loop. So these are the only three possibilities you can write down using only straight lines and circular arcs that give you something closed and that use only three segments. And now you can systematically study all three for different um, target rotation, opera, uh, rotation angles or gate operations. And it turns out that no matter what operation you want to do, the third option, the one that has only circular arcs composing it, is always the fastest. It always has the shortest length. And you can kind of see that in the picture. This, the overall length of this curve looks shorter compared to the other two. And that's always the case. So this is the, the globally time optimal solution to this problem. This gives me the fastest pulse that cancels noise to first order. And 
to get the pulse, I read off the curvature of this thing. And because each part here is a circle, or at least a piece of a circle, that means it has a circle has constant curvature. So then the pulse looks like a square pulse. So initially I have the curve, a circle that's bending one way. So I have a negative uh, square pulse in the beginning. And then I have a curvature going the other way, uh, counterclockwise here. So then I end up with a positive pulse in the middle. And this part's quite long. And then I have this little piece at the end where I'm bending this other way again at the end with a negative curvature. So this is the global time optimal solution of this problem. I can push it further and I can ask, okay, what if I want to also cancel second order noise at the same time? I can go and add one more term to my Lagrangian, which imposes that the area inside the curve vanish. And in this case, the globally optimal solution has five segments, all of which are circular arcs. And this is what it looks like here. So you start here, you trace this path around, and then you come back to the origin. And again, because all of these pieces are circular arcs, my optimal pulse is a square pulse sequence with five different segments. And given some target uh, gate operation, you can, you can systematically figure out what each of these time steps has to be uh, in order to get that rotation angle. Now, of course, I started this discussion by saying that I don't like squares, I don't like square pulses, and I don't like delta functions. Uh, but you know, the fact is that the globally optimal solution is a square pulse sequence. But what we can do is we can then impose bandwidth constraints or constraints on how quickly the pulse can change in time. And then we can look for the smoothest approximation to this optimal square pulse sequence uh, that we can. And there are two ways we can do this. We can either take the optimal square pulse sequence and then just try to smoothen it a bit, like in this green curve here. Or we can go back to the curve itself and try to deform the curve in such a way that we end up with a smooth pulse shape instead of this square pulse sequence. And so we explored both of these approaches. And the second approach tends to give you better results in the end because um, if you smooth, if you deform the curve itself and then find the pulse after that, it's easier to impose these noise cancellation constraints, you know, the vanishing area and the closed curve constraint. Uh, whereas if you smooth the square pulse that you got directly, then you start to violate those constraints. So fix the pulse, so fix the curve first and then find the pulse to get something smooth. Okay, so I've been focused on this simpler example where I had a Hamiltonian that just had epsilon on the diagonals and a driving field in the off diagonal here. Now, what if I go to a more general qubit Hamiltonian where I have this constant delta here, which is this noiseless extra field like the B field I talked about in the spin echo context. So one thing that immediately happens is that I can no longer solve the Schrodinger equation um, even in the absence of noise. So if I set epsilon to zero and look at the Schrodinger equation for this Hamiltonian with delta on the diagonals and omega on the off diagonals, there's no general solution, analytical solution to this problem. And in general, this is, we can think about the time dependent Schrodinger equation like this. We can think about the fact that if you're given a Hamiltonian, it's hard to find the evolution operator. On the other hand, the inverse problem where if you're given the evolution operator, if you want to find the Hamiltonian that generates that evolution operator, that's actually an easy problem because I can basically just solve the Schrodinger equation for the Hamiltonian to get this expression here. And so if I know the evolution operator, I can just read off the Hamiltonian. So this is, so solving the Schrodinger equation is a, a sort of an example of a one-way problem where one way is really hard, but the other way, the inverse problem is easy. And fortunately for us, we're interested in designing the evolution. We want to design a quantum gate. And so we basically have this inverse problem, which is easy. And you know, basically what's happening when we draw these curves is we're designing the evolution operator. And then when we extract the curvature, we're extracting the, we're finding the Hamiltonian, which is the pulse. So this works uh, in this more general qubit Hamiltonian scenario just as well. So here again, I take the evolution operator, I do a perturbative expansion in epsilon. And even though I can't say what u0 is here anymore because I can't solve the Schrodinger equation, it doesn't matter. I can still do this expansion formally. And this first order term here is just some Hermitian matrix. I don't quite know what it is, but it's a Hermitian matrix. And a Hermitian matrix that's two by two is parameterized by three real functions, which I call Rx, Ry, and Rz. Now these three real functions, I'm going to interpret them as the three components of a curve in three dimensions. So here's a closed curve in three dimensions. 
And now what's interesting here is that if I compute the curvature of this three-dimensional curve, again, I find it's the driving field omega t. But now curves in three dimensions are not characterized only by curvature. They also have a second quantity, which is called the torsion, which is a measure of how quickly a curve is twisting out of a plane at every point. And what's really interesting is that if you compute the torsion for this curve that I've defined here from this perturbative expansion, it's exactly equal to this field delta in my Hamiltonian, which if we think about a, an AC driven qubit, this is like the detuning parameter, the difference in the qubit frequency and the driving frequency. And so for this Hamiltonian here, omega of t is the curvature, delta is the torsion. So there's a nice simple relationship between curves in three dimensions and qubits. And the way that error cancellation works is very much the same as we had in our plane curve case earlier without delta. So again, if I want to cancel noise to first order, I need to draw a closed curve now in three dimensions. Here's an example of a closed curve in three dimensions. And I can extract the pulse by computing the curvature, which is shown here. And then by comparing, this is just a comparison of this designed geometrically designed pulse uh, versus a, a naive square pulse. And you can see that if you use the geometrically designed one, you are indeed canceling noise as you expect. Now you can also ask, how does the second order noise cancellation constraint look like in this three-dimensional curve case for this more general qubit Hamiltonian? And now the condition is instead of one area vanishing, now there are three areas that have to vanish. So here's a three-dimensional curve. It's closed, so first no order noise is being canceled. And now the, I, the statement is that if I take projections along three different directions, if I look at the shadows of the curve along three different orthogonal directions, the areas of those shadows have to vanish. And if that happens along all three directions, then second order noise is also canceled. And this is again a totally general statement. So any driving field, any driving field on a qubit that cancels noise corresponds to a closed curve um, and if it's robust to second order, these shadows must have zero area. So no assumptions, no approximations. Now, one issue that comes up is that if I draw an arbitrary curve in three dimensions, it's going to have a, a time varying curvature, but it's also going to have a time varying torsion because a general curve in three dimensions has both of these parameters being time dependent. They vary along the curve. But it's often the case that when I'm driving a qubit, I don't want both of them to vary in time. For example, if I think about this as being like a, a spin and I'm driving it with a magnetic field that's time dependent, but with a fixed frequency, then delta would be constant. Delta should not vary in time. So that's a physical constraint. So this means that I need to look for curves that have constant torsion on the geometry side of things. So trying to find closed curves of constant torsion is actually an active area of, of mathematics in the, in the field of differential geometry of curves. And there have been various works on the, on the topic over the, uh, the last century or so with um, you know, sporadic results. But we came up with a systematic way to find such curves. Um, and the idea is you first construct a curve on the surface of a sphere that has certain rotational symmetries. And then you can then take that curve and plug it into this formula to obtain your three-dimensional space curve. And this curve um, is guaranteed to have constant torsion. And you can tune what the torsion is just by choosing this coefficient in front of the integral appropriately. So we found a systematic way to find closed curves of constant torsion. So, Here's an example of a closed curve of constant torsion. It's actually one I showed on an earlier slide. So this curve here can be, it actually lives on a sphere. So I can take this to be my B of S, my curve on a sphere. And now if I plug it into this formula, I get this three dimensional space curve, which is shown on the right. So this is a closed curve clearly, but it also has constant torsion, which is not so easy to see just by looking at the curve. And then if I compute the curvature of this curve, I can extract the pulse shape, which in this case looks like three rather sharp looking spikes, but they're not delta functions. They're just very sharp pulses. And they correspond to the sharp bends that I have in the space curve. 
Now, one interesting, uh, another thing to mention is that, you know, I've been thinking about the geometric formalism as a way to design new pulses that cancel noise, but I can also turn the thing around and think about this as a diagnostic tool that tells me what's wrong with the pulse I already have. So if you, if you create the pulse using a different method, you can plug it into this formalism and generate the corresponding curve. And you can try to study that curve and see which aspects of the noise is it failing to cancel. Um, and so this was uh, something we've tested out in collaboration with Andrew Zurich's group at the University of New South Wales in Australia, where they work on silicon quantum dot spin qubits. And they had designed um, a series of single qubit gate operations using a numerical recipe called GRAPE. They did an identity gate, an X gate, a Z gate, and a Hadamard gate. And we took each of their, uh, and here are the pulse waveforms that they created numerically, shown on the bottom. And we took each of these and translated it into a three-dimensional curve. And then we studied its noise cancellation properties. So in each of the four cases shown here, you can see that the curve is very, um, very nearly closed. It looks closed in, this, in these images. And then if you look at the three orthogonal projections to study the second order noise cancellation, you can see that in many cases, the area looks like it's canceling here and here and here as well, but there are some other examples where it's not so clear that the noise is being perfectly canceled to second order, like in this Z gate, for example. So this allows you to not only tell to what extent your, your pulse is capable of canceling noise to some order, it also kind of tells you along which quadrant is it failing to cancel the noise. So then you can try to go back and correct the pulse a little bit to, to better cancel that particular part of the noise. Okay, so, so far I've been focused on a single qubit to try to keep things as simple as possible. Um, you can extend this entire formalism to arbitrarily many levels or arbitrarily many qubits. For um, a d-dimensional Hilbert space, you can translate um, the, the description of the evolution operator into a, a space curve living in some higher dimensional space. And the dimension of the space depends on what sort of driving fields you have in your Hamiltonian and what sort of error terms you have. Now, a curve in D dimensions generally has D minus one generalized curvatures. So a curve in three dimensions we said has the regular curvature, but it also has this thing called torsion, which is a, the second generalized curvature in that case. But more generally, if we have a curve in D dimensions, we have D minus one different functions of time that describe how that curve twists and bends as it moves through space. So as we move to more levels and more qubits, the first question to ask is how can we translate the curvatures describing the curve to the Hamiltonian, the control field Hamiltonian? And so in this work here that came out earlier this year, we found a general recursion relation that relates the two quantities. So the generalized curvatures here are these kappas, and we found a recursion relation that relates these generalized curvatures to the different terms in the Hamiltonian. So H0 is the control Hamiltonian. So you can systematically figure out how the two are related to each other. So this generalizes the idea that the curvature is equal to omega of t and the torsion is equal to delta to an arbitrary Hamiltonian. So we tested out this idea in a two qubit example in collaboration with uh, Shankar Desarma and Donovan Bunarakos at the University of Maryland. Here we considered a, a Hamiltonian where we have driving along um, the x direction for one of the qubits and we have this energy splitting for the second qubit, and then we have this coupling term, which is an icing interaction between the two. And here we suppose that the, we have dephasing noise along one of the qubits, the second qubit. So the question then is how can we design omega of t to cancel the effect of this noise to at least first order? So the first thing we did was to compute the generalized curvatures using the recursion relation I showed you on the previous slide. And you can see that they're a little bit messy. We're not going to get into the math here. We have five of them, which is telling us that in this particular case, the evolution operator for this Hamiltonian is descri described by a curve in six dimensions, since I have five curvatures. So I have a six dimensional curve, but it's also highly constrained because you can see all these curvatures, they really only depend on these two constants, E1 and E2, and on this one driving field of mega of t. So I can't just draw any curve in six dimensions. Most curves in six dimensions are not going to correspond to this Hamiltonian. So I need to somehow constrain the curves I look at so that I can find a solution to this problem. And what's nice about this icing type interaction is that my Hamiltonian 
factorizes into two two by two blocks, which means that my six dimensional curve factorizes into two three dimensional curves. So I have a three dimensional curve for this block here and another one for this other block here. And it's a lot, at least for me, it's a lot easier to think about two curves in three dimensions rather than one curve in six dimensions. And now I'm interested in, well, let's take a look at this Hamiltonian again. So here E1 and E2 are constants, which means I need constant torsion curves. And the two curves should also have the same curvature because I have the same omega t appearing here and here. So I'm looking for a pair of 3D curves that have constant torsion each and that have the same curvature and they should be closed so that noise is canceled. So that's the geometric problem I need to solve. Now, one way that we solve this problem is by gluing together a set of helices. So a helix is a curve that has both constant curv uh, curvature and constant torsion. And so we can construct a closed curve by gluing together three helices in the right way. And we did this for both of them. And we chose the helices such that they both, that both curves have the same curvature as required by the physical system that we're studying. And then from these curves, we can extract the pulse omega t, which looks like the square pulse sequence because we started with helices. But now to get smooth pulses, we can apply a smoothing procedure to the curves to turn each helix into a slightly deformed helix, kind of like we did before when we looked for smooth approximations to time optimal pulses. And once we smoothen each of these helices in such a way that we still have closed curves, we can then extract the pulse. And this time we get a nice smooth pulse instead of this square pulse sequence we had previously. So this is a nice systematic procedure for finding pulses that cancel noise to first order in this two qubit system. And we could do this um, both for single qubit operations in the presence of a second qubit with an always on coupling, or we can generate two qubit entangling gates while canceling noise. So we did both of these types of um, scenarios in this paper here. Another okay, question so, before we keep going yeah. at, oh, sorry. Please, um, please. Someone asked, is this analysis true for constant omega even though the torsion could be a function of time? So in this example, we're choosing curves that have both, initially we're choosing curves that have both constant curvature and constant torsion. So a, a helix is, uh, is the curve that has both of those things constant. Yeah. And so if we, you know, a helix is basically a spring. So if we take three springs and glue them together to get a closed thing, then we're guaranteed that the, that the, both the, the pulse and the detuning parameters are going to be constant um, yep. for each piece. Please. Okay, good. Hope that clears it up. Uh, another question just came in. So mm -hmm. since you're already paused, I might as well ask you. Sure. In your two qubit example, could you re-explain briefly how you know that curves exist in 60? Do you apply the recursion until you get zero? Yeah, so one way to do it is to apply the recursion until you get zero. That, that works. Um, you can also do sort of a group theory analysis where you basically look at the terms you have in your Hamiltonian. And basically the question is how many independent terms do you have? So here I have X2, Z2, and Z1, Z2. If I start taking commutators of these terms with each other, how many new terms, types of terms do I generate? And also I need to look at commutators of these terms with my noise term Z2. And so if you compute all the commutators, you find you end up with six different um, Pauli operators that are distinct from each other. Okay. So Thank that's a, another way you can do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we've uh, extended and applied this uh, idea to a number of different um, problems and, and situations. I'll just uh, mention them briefly. So We've applied it to the landau zener problem. I'll, I'll show you a few slides on that in a second. Um, in uh, everything I've discussed so far, I've assumed that this noise term epsilon is constant during the pulse. Uh, it's allowed to vary from one run of the experiment to the next, but for each pulse I apply, I assume it's constant. And when I do that, that's called the quasi-static noise approximation. And it's a pretty good approximation for most types of noise that people encounter in solid state qubit devices, like in superconducting qubits or spins and semiconductors. 
Um, but in reality, the noise does have some time dependence. Epsilon really is varying a little bit in time during the application of a single pulse. And so another question we can ask is, can we still do this sort of noise cancellation using this geometric idea in that context where epsilon has time dependence? So that's discussed in this work here. Uh, we've also extended it to the cancellation of multiple types of noise simultaneously, not just epsilon noise, not just noise in the detuning, but also noise in the driving field itself. And um, I might mention a little bit about that in a second. And I think I've already mentioned that we can also apply space curve to diagnose pulse areas. So let me say a little bit about the landau zener problem, and then I probably won't have time for the other two topics. So the landau zener problem is like this. We have an energy spectrum for some system, you know, some processor with a bunch of qubits. And in that energy spectrum, we have avoided crossings. If we're talking about two levels that have some sort of coupling relating them. And these avoided crossings are both um, useful for different sorts of applications or things you want to do. Like you can use them to use to do gates, to initialize qubits, or to do qubit readout. Um, but they can also be a nuisance if you're just trying to tune your energy through the spectrum in some way. And if you try to tune through an avoided crossing like this, there's a probability, the landau zener probability, that you'll end up in, in the excited state. So a common question is if you start on the ground state on one side and you sweep your control field so that you pass through this avoided crossing and you're trying to get to the ground state on this side, how do you do that in such a way that you don't also have a component in this upper state here? And if you sweep very quickly, you always end up in the excited state as Landau and Zener showed. So one way you can do it is to tune things adiabatically, but uh, oftentimes you don't wanna go adiabatically because you need to do things more quickly than that. And so then the question becomes, how can you do this um, quickly without you know, having leakage to this excited state? So we've shown, uh, so another issue that can arise is that the, that the avoided crossing here has noise in it. So that these energy levels can have noise fluctuations and that means that this gap here also has a fluctuation, which I can again call epsilon. And so another question we can ask is, how can we do a landau zener sweep through the avoided crossing in such a way that the noise is canceled to first order or maybe second order as well? So here the Hamiltonian looks kind of similar to what we considered previously, except now we usually think about the driving field as being along the z-axis because we're sort of tuning an energy space in the landau zener problem. And then this delta plus epsilon is this energy gap between the two um, levels shown here. So in the classic landau zener problem, they considered linear driving where this omega t was ramped linearly from a, a very large negative value to a very large positive value. So the first question we asked is, what does that look like geometrically? So if you take a linear ramp, and let's look at the case where, there, where this parameter delta is zero. So in this case, I'm thinking about the avoided crossing as being created by the noise. Um, whereas if there was no noise, I would just have a regular level crossing. So in this case, if I translate the linear ramp to a curve, it's a curve in the plane since delta is zero. And in particular, it has this particular spiral structure that's called the Euler spiral. So it's a, it's a shape that's been studied for quite a long time. And for example, one fun fact is that if you take an orange and you peel it uh, uniformly so that the peel has the same width all the way through, then if you take that peel and lay it on, the, on a flat tabletop surface, it's going to have this shape and the limit where the, the width of the peel is infinitely thin. So there's been a lot of uh, interesting mathematics related to this curve, both in engineering and uh, pure mathematics. And here's a, yet another place where it seems to arise. And one thing that uh, so Fei Zhuang, our student at Virginia Tech, was able to prove uh, using this geometric connection is that it's impossible to cancel noise using a monotonic pulse. So if you wanted to sweep through the avoided crossing using the simple linear ramping time, uh, this ramp profile, you could never cancel noise with this. You must have some non-monotonicity non in order to cancel noise. So here's an example of a curve that will give us a, a noise canceling pulse. So here's again, this naive uh, Euler spiral, or at least part of it. And then in comparison, we can look at this, this um, closed zero area curve here in blue, which is made up of an Euler spiral segment and two semicircles kind of capping the two ends. 
So if you take the naive Hoiberg spiral, it gives you the linear ramp like I showed on the previous slide. But now if you take this geometrically engineered thing, it ends up looking like this pulse here, where because we have a circle initially, we have this square piece, and then we have a piece of Euler spiral in the middle, which gives us this linear ramp here, and then another square from the final semicircle. And then if we look at the fidelity of the gate operation as a function of the noise strength, uh, the noise fluctuation in the energy gap, uh, we see that using this geometrically engineered pulse gives us much better performance across a, a broad range of noise strength compared to just doing a naive uh, sweep. And you can see that in this geometrically engineered example, we needed to do something non-monotonic in order to cancel the noise, as is consistent with our general theorem. Now, we can also consider the case where this delta parameter is non-zero, meaning that we have a finite avoided crossing gap, even in the absence of noise. In this case, we need to look at closed curves of constant torsion, like I discussed earlier. And we can use this example I showed on an earlier slide. If we translate this into a pulse, it looks like this, um, this sort of blue sweep here, which is initially linear, but then it has these rather sharp features in the middle, and then it continues to be linear um, at later times. And so again, if we compare this to a naive linear ramping, like you would normally do in a landau zener problem, you find that the robust and geometrically engineered pulse profile has much better performance. And in this linear ramp case, it's not surprising that it doesn't do so well because if you map this to a curve in three dimensions, indeed it's not anywhere near to being closed. So it's not surprising that it's failing to, can to cancel any bit of the noise. Now, I wanted to also mention a little bit about some of these other applications and extensions. So in the case of time-dependent noise, we've shown that we can, so here imagine that epsilon is not constant during a single pulse but it has time dependence. How can we still do something in this case? So Deacon Lee, another student in our group, was able to show that you can translate the problem now to needing to cancel a sequence of closed curves instead of just one closed curve. And roughly speaking, essentially what happens is that for each closed curve in your sequence, you cancel another power of, um, of the filter function in the vicinity of zero frequency. So the idea here is that in the case of time dependent noise, usually most of the noise is still concentrated at low frequencies. And so if we can somehow make this system insensitive to those low frequency fluctuations, we can still cancel noise to a pretty good extent. And so we can, we can basically expand the sensitivity of the qubit to the noise in different powers of the frequency around zero frequency. That's, that's what we mean by the filter function. And so if we can cancel those terms order by order, we can basically make the qubit insensitive. And so we showed a, a systematic way to do this. Basically, how do you find sequences of closed curves um, that will give you pulses that have this um, that noise cancellation effect for time-dependent noise at low frequency? And we've tested out this technique for both uh, virtual random quantum baths and also one over F noise, which is a very ubiquitous type of noise in solid state qubits. And it seems to work extremely well. And in some cases, it even seems to outperform existing dynamical decoupling sequences, which are often thought to be optimal for this type, this type of noise cancellation. OK, and then finally, I'll say just a little bit about canceling multiple types of noise, noise at the same time. <clears throat> so in this case, imagine that you have not only this epsilon noise term in your Hamiltonian, but also, for example, you could have a fluctuation in the driving field itself. And then the goal, again, is to engineer the pulse such that the evolution operator is the target operation you want uh, up to at least first order. And <clears throat> so the question is, how can we extend the geometric formalism to account for this other type of noise? And how can we cancel it? So there are a few ways you can do this. So I'm going to talk about just one. And the idea here is to connect the geometric formalism to something which is um, been studied for the last couple of decades called holonomic gates. So a holonomic gate is a, geometric, is a gate that's based on geometric phases, like the Berry phase. Although here we don't have to assume that the evolution is adiabatic. And the basic idea is that given some quantum evolution, uh, given some trajectory of the state in Hilbert space, you can map that trajectory onto the block sphere. And then you try to engineer the evolution so that the target rotation angle is purely determined by the by the solid angle enclosed by this trajectory on the block sphere. 
So if you can make the trajectory closed, and if you can engineer the evolution so that all of the phase that gets accumulated is the geometric phase, the solid angle inside this trajectory, then you can, in principle, get a, a gate which is robust to any sort of, sort of noise that only perturbs um, the rate at which you traverse the path, but does not traverse, but does not perturb the path itself. So that you know, so long as the solid angle that's um, enclosed remains the same, then the gate should be robust. So that's the basic idea behind holonomic gates. But one issue here is that such gates are, you know, while they can be robust to certain types of driving field noise that basically just speed up the rate at which you trace out this trajectory, but don't deform the trajectory, they are susceptible to transverse noise like this epsilon noise I've been talking about because that will in general deform this path. And so if you, for example, look at a simple model of a geometric gate, which is the so-called orange slice model, you can, which is comprised of two um, arcs like this going from north to south pole, forming a wedge. If you map this onto a space curve, one of our error curves here, you can see that this thing is very far from being closed, which is just illustrating that this simple example of a geometric gate is, is not at all robust to first order transverse noise. So then how can we create holonomic gates that are also robust to transverse noise? And so we did this by showing that there's a, actually a really nice relationship between holonomic evolution and our space curves. And in fact, for any smooth closed space curve, you can show that there's a unique holonomic trajectory. So the idea is that we start from a space curve and then the only thing we need to do to get a holonomic evolution, to make it a holonomic gate, is to change a little bit the way in which we map the curve to the Hamiltonian, the control fields. So here's a simple example of a family of closed space curves that uh, Wen Cheng Dong created. He was uh, the main person behind this work. Um, so starting from a space curve, you change a little bit the mapping from space curve to control field or control Hamiltonian. In this case, these are the three control fields you end up with. And now given these three control fields, these will implement an evolution that is both holonomic and also noise canceling, transverse noise canceling, so that you get the benefits of both things at the same time. So we call this doubly geometric gates because we have the geometry of our space curves and we have the geometry that's associated with uh, holonomic gates and holonomic evolution. So if we take these uh, geometrically engineered pulses and test them out for some uh, different sorts of quantum operations and compare to example, for example, to the standard orange slice model holonomic gate, we get much better fidelities for a wide range of noise strengths because we're canceling not only errors due to uh, fluctuations in the pulse, but also transverse noise errors at the same time. So that's uh, basically my story. So just to conclude a little bit here, so I've shown you that robust gates are in one-to-one -one correspondence with closed geometric curves. And the nice thing about this geometric point of view is that it gives us a global view of the optimal control space. So because the length of the curve is equal to the evolution time, I can, as I showed you, we can systematically find the fastest pulses that cancel noise, given some experimental constraints on waveforms and other things. Um, and typically, if you use numerical recipes like GRAPE or, or others, it can be really hard to, to ensure that you find the global optimum to a given control problem, although there, have, there has been some progress in that direction recently. But usually you end up with a, a local optimum in the space of solutions. But using this geometric approach, you can get some information about the global optimum, the global landscape of solutions that can lead you to the best result. And I've shown you it works for multi-qubit multi systems and multiple noise sources acting at the same time, uh, which is uh, very important and very powerful. So with that, um, I'll just acknowledge my group at Virginia Tech, who, you know, some of whom have done pretty much all the work I described. And I'll just uh, alert you that there are postdoc positions available if you're interested. Thank you so much, Ed, for that really wonderful talk. Um, we do have at least a few more questions if we have a few more minutes here. Um, so somebody's just asking a clarifying question. So to clarify, can the two-state landau zenier model generalize to multi-state systems? Oh, yeah, there are certainly uh, versions of the landau zenier problem for more than two levels that have been studied over the years. 
Um, you can do that with the geometric approach. There's no limit to how many levels you can consider. It's going to correspond to a curve in higher dimensions. Um, mm -hmm. But we, that's not something that we've looked at yet. So that's an interesting question. Okay, cool. Uh, and my question, I think, actually is probably maybe slightly obnoxious, but also sort of obvious is what happens when you think about, you know, trying to cancel noise greater than second order? Uh, yeah, so actually, I didn't mention the, um, so in the, in the case of plane curves, we showed that if you want to cancel third order noise, it corresponds to a certain, there's a certain signed volume that lives on top of the curve that has to have, that has to vanish. So you can also have volumes vanish. Okay. And in, at fourth order, there's a similar constraint as well. And we have one or two examples of pulses that seem to cancel up to arbitrarily high orders, but we're not totally clear on what the constraints are. Some sort of signed volumes that have to have to vanish. But the, okay. in, the, in the general cases, that question is not fully answered. Cool. Um, and then I guess sort of the last question I have is, I know you said you were working with some experimental collaborators. Uh, is any of that data on the actual noise cancellation available yet? Or is that published in one or two of these papers I'm not familiar with? Uh, it's not available yet, but it's coming out soon. Okay, great. So keep your eyes open for that, I guess. Okay, um, if there's not any other last questions, I guess I'll give people just another second here. Um, yeah, I guess I think we're good. So I wanna thank you again, Ed, so much for being here. Uh, it was a really, really interesting talk about material that I was not familiar with at all before. Um, and it's great to see uh, one of my former postdocs or one of my former friends from Pitt, Chen Chu, actually working on this project uh, as well with you. So that's really exciting to see. Um, all right. Well, thank you so much again for being here today. And uh, I hope everyone has a great rest of their Friday.